Right. Thanks, Jay. Um, welcome. We are going to talk about Python this morning. Uh, can you guys all hear me? Yeah, OK, good. Um, just a quick question. Who here has used Python for HPC? Ah, OK. Who would like to? OK. You're in the right spot. Um, my name is Francis Van Zon. I am at Cynet. Uh, we've done introductions already at uh, Cynet at Toronto. Um, traditionally, I was not a Python programmer. Uh, my, let's say, native language, if you don't count basic from when I was little, uh, is C++. And so when people started using Python, I was skeptical like a lot of HPC people, and I'll let you know why. Um, but that doesn't seem to stop people from using Python, so I got on board. And so this is kind of what I learned. Uh, what we're going to look at today, this morning, uh, we've only got two hours. So I had originally hoped for more time, and we'd have hands-on where we actually do stuff. This is going to be hands-on in the follow-along kind of uh, uh, sphere. And then afterwards, if you have questions, or if you have questions because there are helpers, um, that we can, we can try and resolve them. But as you will see, to get anything performance done in Python, we need help from a bunch of packages. And um, so this talk is not going to look at one package in particular. Um, I want to give you, um, as I said, kind of what I learned. What is a, a couple of strategies that do actually work? Um, it's easy to find online or even on YouTube tutorials on particular packages. So not everything will go at, as deeply as you might want but I want you to show what you can do with them and how you can get started so you don't, you're not lost in the field of, of thousands of packages that all claim that they do parallel programming in Python. Uh, we'll start with uh, performance and looking at performance in Python. Why are people in HPC so skeptical when you say you're using Python? Um, how do we find out where things are slow? So parallel to this session is a profiling session on the fifth floor. Um, you are also in a profiling session. You just didn't know it yet. Um, so we're going to look at some profiling tools for Python that will tell us where things are slow before we start improving things, and then we'll start improving things. Uh, we'll look at uh, fast arrays in Python and how to do that. Uh, we'll look at parallel programming in Python uh, towards the end. So if you want to follow along, uh, you can do so on bridges. Um, so you, you should SSH in. By now, I'm sure you know how that goes. If you have issues, uh, let us know. Um, and then if, um, I've put code in my directory, and it should be accessible. Um, it was last time I checked. Uh, so copy this whole directory. You'll have the code, and also have a little script called uh, um, HPC code uh, activate, and that will actually activate a virtual environment um, that has all the packages installed already. Um, when you're doing this yourself, you will want to install the packages we're using in your own directory. But to get started, it's much easier if you just use the environment that I've already set up. And so uh, that's what that does. And if you want to actually measure the performance differences, you will need your own dedicated resources. And so I stole uh, the idea of, uh, of Andrew of yesterday. Uh, there's a script in this directory called interactive8.sh that, uh, that should get you an interactive session when you uh, launch it uh, for the remainder of this, uh, this session. For, for eight, you'll get eight cores, which is about as much as we'll need for, uh, for the examples here. Questions? The slides, by the way, are on the, on the website. Um, so if you go down to, uh, exactly, that's why I'm showing it. I can't find it either. Uh, here, it should be here. And then you scroll down, and here, it's, it's these guys. Python slides. So if you want to follow along, uh, copy things, although copying from PDFs can be tricky. Um, but in any case, they are there. Good. OK. So let's talk about Python's performance. Um, and we'll have to deal with some harsh truth here. Uh, Python is a nice language. Um, it's high level. It's interpreted. Uh, you can start it, you can type a command, it does the command, then you can type your next command. If there's an error, you see it right away. Um, your variables don't have to be typed. Um, whatever you assign them to will automatically have that type. Um, it's fairly easy to learn. It's fairly easy to read if it's at least written uh, reasonably well. Um, and because of those reasons, 
putting something together in Python tends to be faster than in compiled languages, where you have to first get the hurdle of uh, compiling your code and make sure all the details are correct. In Python, you can be a little bit more uh, quick. I'm going to really put Python through the ringer. Um, this is an example that Python, almost by definition, is going to be bad at, and that's on purpose. Uh, it, it's a, a diffusion equation. Some of the other uh, um, hands-ons might have used something similar uh, in the form of a Laplace equation. Um, what this does is it looks at the time evolution of temperature on a square, in this case. So this is the differential equation we're uh, solving. We'll use a square domain. Uh, rho is, you can think of it as the temperature. Um, and uh, it has, so it's a square from x1 to x2 in both directions. And let's say the temperature is zero on the boundary. Um, we give it some initial condition, so we start our temperature field, and then we see how it basically decays to zero, because that's what diffusion will do for you. Um, so rho here is the density or temperature, same equation, so whatever is your favorite interpretation, x, y are your spatial coordinates, t is time. So this is a time-resolved uh, uh, um, uh, problem, and d is just a constant that sets the time scale, so it's usually one uh, for all our examples here. Uh, this is what it's going to do. Um, so in case the, the formula doesn't immediately uh, show you what's happening, imagine that this is actually uh, four burners on a stove, and we switch them on at some point, and they're hot. Uh, that's this top left. Uh, left uh, and then we switch off the stove, and we see how the temperature decays, and this is what is supposed to happen. This is the result of this, uh, solving this, uh, this PDE, this partial differential equation. Uh, so that's what we want. Um, now we know it already because I solved it, but this, this is what's going to happen. The way you solve these equations, um, if you're not so familiar with, is you discretize them. So partial differential equations have values for the temperature field at every point. That's infinitely many points. Computers don't really like that. Um, I don't like it either. So you discretize it, uh, and then you replace those differential equations with uh, discrete uh, finite differences. And that's how you solve it. And so in those cases, you just need the neighbors of, your, uh, of each cell. And uh, there's a way to, to go forward in time uh, with this discretized form. The more points you have, the slower it will be, uh, but the more accurate it, it will be. Um, I'm using graphics here, although in the code, if you copy it over, you will see that it's been switched off, because it actually turns out that the graphics part is the most expensive part. Um, of the whole computation. And so as we are speeding it up, it doesn't speed up because the graphics is still slow. And also we're remote, so it's probably going to pop up uh, tomorrow. Um, but if you're doing this, or you're copying it over uh, on your own machine, the graphics in Python isn't done in matplotlib. Um, that's great about Python. It sort of comes with, with visualization. Um, in C++ and Fortran, I've used an old library called pgplot that you still find around everywhere, but it's like really old but it works, and, and so those are the pictures here. Um, another thing that's good to do is not to have output every time step, so it's, it's taking small time steps, so it's not a parameter that says how frequently you time out, uh, because the, uh, the output can also uh, change the, uh, or be, be a dominant factor in your timing, and it's not what we're after here. So all these parameters that we've seen in this example are uh, speci specified in one file. Uh, it's called diff2dparams.py, um, but it's written in a, a hybrid form that can actually be read by C++ and Fortran as well by some um, nasty tricks uh, that you should never do yourself. But this way we can have one file and we can recompile our code or run the code again and they will all use the same parameters. So the diffusion, x1, x2, how long we want to run, uh, the size of our pixels here, so the dx, uh, how frequently you want output and whether or not we want graphics. Because, but as I said, uh, we're going to turn off the graphics for now. Um, they're pretty. We've seen them once on the slide. We're good. Now we want, them, uh, want to know how, to, uh, how the computation goes. So this code that I uh, put together has a C++ version, a Fortran version, and a Python version with exactly the same algorithm. Uh, loops in C++ became loops in Python, became loops in Fortran. Um, the, the indexing, apart from uh, 0 to 1 in, uh, in Fortran, is exactly the same. It's the same lines of code. Um, for C++ and, uh, and Fortran, of course, we have to compile it. So we compile it first. There's a make file, so you make it. And 
Um, because we're going to do timing, just to be fair, let's see how long it takes to do the compilation because Python will not need a compilation. Um, so in, one, in a bit more than one second, uh, these two um, C++ and Fortran versions have been compiled into executables that I've called .x here, um, just to be clear what it is. Okay, so I'm running them. Uh, oh, so the spacing is a bit off, but uh, so the diffusion constant, uh, sorry, the diffusion equation solver in C++ took 0.52 seconds, in Fortran 0.43 seconds, uh, and in Python, you can't quite see it, it's 212 seconds. And that's what I meant. Um, Python is a slow language if you just take it as the same kind of language as C++ or Fortran. Um, it's about 400 times slower here than the compiled versions. And so this could be the end of this, this presentation. I could say, well, that means we are now spending the rest of the time learning C++ if you didn't know it yet, or Fortran would be even better. Um, by the way, those of you poo-pooing Fortran, this is why it's still around. At, uh, it can give a little bit of a speed up. Depends on what you're doing. Okay, so, but we're talking about Python's uh, performance here. So why are we going on? Why is there still a session here? Why do we bother with Python? Um, this is why. This is the whole code to solve this partial differential equation in Python. And while it's a little bit squished because I wanted to show that it fits on a single slide, um, which it doesn't really, but it does kind of, um, is, is is why we do it. Uh, and I took out the graphics, but the graphics is this little corner here, uh, just using some Matplotlib stuff. So all of that gave us this whole application. And if we wanted to change something, so somewhere here there's a stencil, uh, a plus uh, uh, operator is computed from the density. Um, if you wanted another stencil, well, just change this around here. It's pretty easy to see what you should do, and you can see if you can get more accurate results or faster results. Um, so. That's why. It's fairly concise, it's fairly expressive. Uh, you can say what you want to happen and it happens. Um, you don't have to worry too much about the types of your, uh, of your variables. If you assign it a 1.5, it's a float. If you assign it a hello world, it's a string. Uh, so you can write fairly concise, clear code. Uh, it's very flexible. Um, we have a bunch of packages av available too, like matplotlib. We don't have to worry too much about those things. And that all makes that writing in Python tends to be a much faster uh, uh, development cycle than in, in compiled languages. Also, on purpose, I used an example that is really uh, tightly coupled. There's a little bit of computation for all of these uh, pixels, let's call them. Um, and so it's very tightly coupled, and that's not something that Python will be good at. Um, again, we'll see exactly why. Um, so, if that's not your uh, application, if your application is more along the lines of, I have a bunch of uh, genome sequences and I want to align them and I'm calling a function, but I'm using Python to orchestrate that, or I'm setting up a simulation and I'm calling a package that has a compiled component that does the actual uh, computational part, uh, or I'm, I'm uh, going through a bunch of data and most of the time I'm actually spending reading that data and writing it back uh, in those cases, the fact that the Python part is slow is not a big deal. So there's many cases where, especially for like pre and post processing, this is perfectly fine. If your code does what it's supposed to do in one minute, then why are you spending time making it one second? Um, it's done in a minute. Just... But in this case, we have something that is, that is 400 times slower than we want it to be. Does it have to be that slow? And the answer is no. Um, and we'll see how we get there. But before we know what to attack in this code, we should look at, okay, where is the time spent? If we don't know what part of the code is slow, uh, we might have a, a guess, but our guess is likely wrong, especially if you didn't expect it to be so slow, likely something else is going on than what you thought. So just thinking about it, it's not gonna give you the right answer. You want a tool that shows you, here's where your program spends all of its time, this is the part that you should try to improve. So that's what a profiling tool does. It, it takes your code, it runs it, at, and tells you where the time is spent. Um, so the other session is telling you how to do that for say C++ and Fortran. Um, I'm telling you here how to do it in Python. Um, so we're gonna focus on pure timing. 
Um, that's one resource. Uh, you could call it a CPU resource. It's really the wall time resource. There's other resources. Um, you might find that your uh, Python program runs out of memory, and then you'd need a different profiler to figure out where it's losing all that memory. In this case, we're just gonna, gonna focus on uh, mainly how long does it take. So wall clock performance is what we could call this. Um, and this profiling can be done by Python. There's a package that comes with Python. It's called cProfile. Uh, and with that uh, loaded, you can actually see and watch uh, which functions you spend most of the time. So that's nice. Python already knows what functions are called. It can keep track of that. And cProfile is relatively uh, low overhead. However, it, go it works on a function-by-function -function, uh, basis. So if you remember the code was a whole bunch of lines, there was only one function in it. The rest were all lines. So if we're gonna use cProfile, you'll see it'll tell us that all of the time is spent in this only function we have. There's no information. We might want more detailed information. We might want line by line uh, information, how much time was spent in each line. For that, we need different tools. Um, so one of the tools that uh, we can use for that is Line Profiler, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, another tool for that is Colleen, um, which I'll also show how to work, uh, how it works. So if you have a very modular code, though, where there's lots of function calls or functions, uh, that's how your code is, is uh, structured, cProfile will tell you, without having to do anything else, uh, um, where what function is the costly one. So that can be a good thing. It won't be here, uh, because if we do it here, um, we're using cProfile. This is how you use it. So remember, diff2d.py is that Python code. Um, we would normally run it with Python diff2dpy, and it, it reads that parameter file. Um, here we want to run it through cProfile, so that's what the dash m cProfile does, and then I like to sort things according to the cumulative time that it spends in each function, uh, so to actually know how long it's spent in each function rather than uh, um, itself time, as they call it. Uh, so we do that. Um, the first thing that will come is the actual output of your program. Uh, that's the dot, dot, dot here. I'm skipping that on the slide. And then it tells you uh, how many times a function was called and how long it took. Um, so this, uh, this took a little longer. This could have been from a different machine. I don't think that's the, uh, the amount of overhead. In any case, um, and then it tells you where the time is spent. So it says, well, it's spending um, pretty much all of the time in diff2d.py14. That looks like a line number, but it isn't. It's just a line number where the function main starts. That was the only function that was in there. And so it's telling us, as I said, 100% of the time is spent in the only function you have. Um, if you had a model of code, this would give you more information. This is how you would use it. So that's obviously, in this case, not good enough. So we're going to look at uh, something that can do line-by-line -line profiling. And there's a package for that called Line Profiler. Um, it's installed in the environment that I'm giving you, but pip install Line Profiler will give you the package as well. Um, and one thing that you will want to do when you're profiling a code, if you find your code is slow, but you've run it already, you don't really have to make it any faster because it already ran. Um, and if you have to run it again with other parameters, do you really want to wait again every time you do a profile? So you're going to try and create a smaller version of your code uh, or, or of your case. So you change your parameters so that it's still substantial, but you'll be able to see where the hotspots are without having to wait for 500 seconds um, or, if it's worse, hours. Um, so how do we do that? We create a smaller case, so we're going to increase our, uh, increase our pixel size, decrease our resolution, that will speed up the code, um, but we'll still have a, uh, an idea of where things are. Um, and with Line Profiler, one of the things that this is slightly annoying is we have to change the code. Not by much, but we have to change the code um, by putting a decorator in front of a function. Um, so yeah, we have a function, it's called in main. we will decorate it with at profile. And you'll see in a second how uh, once you've done that, that's the only thing you have to change. On every, any function you want the lines to be profiled off, you put that in front of it. Um, you run a line profiler, and for some reason, the way you do it is by another command called kernprof. So line profiler is the package. It comes with a, an executable called kernprof that runs your script. Uh, and if you don't do dash v, you actually don't get the results that are put in a, uh, in a file. So this dash v will put it in the, 
uh, on the screen, and dash L, as you might guess, means we're looking at line-by-line -line profiling. Uh, so just to see how that would, uh, would work, here's a, uh, a very silly script. Uh, it allocates a, a list of uh, 4 million roughly uh, ones, and then it does something with the first one of it, creates a string out of it, uh, delete something, print something. Just silly stuff um, that does um, um, nothing. Uh, but it, suppose I wanted to profile this. The first thing I have to do is put, a, put it in a function, because I still have to decorate a function. I still need a function. So I'm going to create one function. I'm calling it uh, profile wrapper here. All this code goes in that, uh, in that function. And then at the end, I call the function. I'm sure you've seen things like this, but that's uh, now I've got a function, I can decorate it, and this is what happens. So if I don't put the add profile, it's just a, function, uh, just a script that does the same thing as the script on the left here. Um, but with add profile, I can profile it now. So I'm running it. Current prof dash L dash V profile me. That's the name of the, of the script now dot pi. So what happens is that first you get the output of the actual code. So that prints one here, uh, and A. So one is a one. Um, and then it shows the profile output. So it says, I wrote the profile results also to this file. Fine, but it also shows it on the screen. It says what the timer unit is. So a lot of these profilers work by basically sampling. So every ever so often, um, the runtime will see where is my application at? Um, what function am I in? What functions were called from that function? And it samples that. And so by sampling, if you have enough samples, you know uh, what percentage of the time is spent in which line, um, if you sample by line. Uh, but the sampling time here is about a microsecond. So if your code only took one microsecond, you wouldn't have a sample. And so it can happen that your runs are too short for, for there to be enough statistics. In this case, we ran for uh, 0 0.018 seconds, which has many microseconds in it, so we're OK. Um, and the result here is, is, the, uh, is the profile. So on the right, it shows you your code. And then line by line, it shows what, uh, how much time is spent there in units of the timer unit, so in microseconds in this case. Um, 50, uh, so 41% of the time was spent here in allocating this, uh, these, these 4 million ones, and 57% uh, uh, of the time in deleting that, sale, that same array again. Um, so it's pure memory stuff going on here, but it takes time. So that's a, it's a great tool. We had to just put a profile in it. And um, we didn't know anything about the code. That's why it was such a nonsensical code. But we might not have guessed that the code spent most of the time allocating the, the, the memory. That might not have been something that was obvious to us. And now we know it. Another uh, package that people use and that is a little bit more versatile than line, profile, line profiler is this Kaleen package. Uh, so as I was already announcing, we will see lots of packages come by. These are my select packages that I would suggest you look at. Um, so line profiler was our first one. Scalene is our next one. And you'll say anytime the slide says the something something package, hey, it's a new package. Um, What's nice about this one, it can not just do CPU uh, profiling. It can also tell you where uh, memory is allocated. It can even uh, register if the GPU is used. Uh, it is uh, fast. It is uh, more accurate than most of its other uh, profilers. Um, what it also can do is it can distinguish whether or not you're spending time in Python or in a function, uh, like a C or a Fortran function that's part of a package. Because uh, once you're in that function, it should be as fast as compiled languages, right? because it's compiled. Um, and there's, there, you're basically in the fast part of your execution. But you can also see if you're spending a lot of time in your Python code. And what is especially nice is you don't need to decorate anything. So the code we just had was profiled. We have to re remove that profile uh, uh, decorator to make it uh, the, uh, to run in production again. It's a bit annoying. You'd rather not. How does that work? Even simpler, so we don't have to change anything. Uh, so I'm just going to profile our diff, diff2d.py here. Um, and I think I, I reduced the, uh, the, the resolution uh, in this case. And then instead of running it through Python, you run it through Scalene. So you've installed Scalene, pip install Scalene, um, and, uh, and you run it. Now, if you do this on your local computer, by the way, 
if you can do profiling, development stuff in your own laptop and your own computer, almost always better than to do it remotely. Partly because annoying latencies, you press a key, you wait a second for it to happen. Uh, also, uh, you, know, you might not have a network and, uh, access, so if you can, do it locally. But what it would do is open a browser. So it will create a profile, it will open a browser and show you the result. And that's great because it's somewhat interactive, you can hover over things. Um, but when you are doing this remotely, when either you can't or you want to see how it really works on the remote system, like Bridges, um, then that's, that's, there might not be a browser there. So if you have a browser, it will open it up and it will look something like this. Uh, this graph, first I thought that would mean something. This is like the number of uh, 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 CPU seconds, GPU seconds, and memory, and that's how the triangle is formed. This triangle always has the same shape, um, so it's just its logo. <coughs> and in any case, it'll show you the profile here. So by line, it, has, it shows you what lines are, are important, and on the left here, it shows you what, what percentage of the time is spent there. So there's a lot of time spent in this Laplacian computation. Um, this might not surprise you, but it might also surprise you, so that's fine. Um, and some of the time is spent, as it said, in native, so that, uh, that is non-Python parts, uh, and, but a good bit of it is also in the Python part, so actually figuring out what uh, it means to take the index i and put it in square brackets and stuff like that. So if you are remote and you want to use it, you can. Um, you just have to give it a uh, an option, say, dash dash CLI, and it gives you the command line interface, and it shows it uh, on the screen. Make sure your font is nice and small and your monitor is nice and big. Uh, it's colorized. I don't expect you can see what it does, except to get the idea that um, it is indeed uh, showing all the lines, and it shows percentages that you can't read because the, the colors are horrible uh, on the screen at this point. Uh, but it has the time in Python, the time that is done natively, uh, the memory in Python, um, whether there's copies made, and if, you, if it was a GPU code as well, or it had a GPU package that it called, there would be columns for that as well. Um, so you can now figure out what lines of code were really uh, important. Now, one thing, I'm reason, yeah, so I actually just did all of this. The slicer. So this is the demonstration. This was the demonstration of how it works for Diff2D. I reduced the resolution. I made sure there's no graphics. Uh, I, for line profile, I added line profile, and I, I ran it through, and it showed me the, the lines that were important. Uh, for Scalene, I don't want the decorator. It won't work. Um, and then you run the same case through it, and you get this result. The reason I'm showing both, because you might think, well, Scalene gives me everything. Why am I bothering with this other package and decorators? Is that Scalene actually uh, times things like for loops as one big thing. So it will look like the last line of your for loop takes all the time. That's not true. That's the cumulative of the for loop. And it's a, an optimization. And, and often it doesn't matter. You're, you're already happy if you know that that for loop is taking a lot of time. But if you want line by line uh, resol resolved results for lines inside the for loop, line profiler is still sort of your best bet. So that's why I'm showing you both possibilities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good question. So the question is, um, what's the difference between these different times? There's a Python time, there's a native time, there's a system time? Um, so the, the Python time is, okay, so when Python is run, uh, it reads a line of code and it interprets it and then it, it calls Python functions, that's all part of the Python. But if one of those functions is actually a C or a Fortran function, it goes into what's called native mode, it's not a mode, a native code. So time spent in those functions, which are compiled, are called native, but then there's a separate set of functions that are part of the operating system. Um, like writing to disk and uh, other, other system functions. That's the system part. Um, very often the system part is small. If the system part is large, you're probably waiting for I.O. a lot. Um, that's, uh, that's sort of a hallmark of when that's large. Um, so that's, that's what those three mean. Um, if you're following along and you use the time command, which I did a few times, that also shows three sections and it's very similar. Um, there's the, the user time, which is kind of uh, and then there's a system time, but it doesn't distinguish Python from C. 
Yeah. Right? I think you get percentages, right? Yeah. There might be an option, but I'm not quite sure. So it's, yeah, it's really telling you relative stuff, and then you, I guess you take the total time and compute it yourself. That's a bit, maybe there's an option I, that I don't know about. Yeah, that's true. Other questions? Yeah. So that's a good, if, okay, so I don't know what happens if it's a C function that then calls Python somehow. I actually don't know if, what, if it figures that out. Um, it's not, it's probably not what you want in any case, but, uh, but yeah, it's also true if it, once it's in that C code, it, it doesn't see what, so the lines of that C code, it won't profile for you. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, has no access to that. Um, All right, so in principle, we know where the, the pain points are. Let me just see if I can. And they were basically in these lines, because the, the font was so small, so I'll tell you. Uh, in the Laplace line, there was some time spent also in just the I and the J loop. Um, not like, I forgot, but something like 5 or 6% or so. Um, it's just in doing the range thing, for some reason. Um, Laplace takes quite a while, and then dense takes quite a while. The rest is relatively small comparatively. So those are lines we want to, we will want to attack. So now that we know that, uh, so those are lines that uh, use dense and Laplace. Uh, dense and Laplace are lists of lists. So the list of lists here is uh, is a way to do a matrix in pure Python. Python itself doesn't have matrices, but you can have lists of lists. Um, so that's that's an indication that we're doing something uh, very Pythonic, um, lists of lists, no issue, um, but that's where we find the performance issue. So one way to try and solve that is say, okay, so we have these, these matrices, maybe there's something wrong with that. There's a way to do what people call fast arrays for Python, uh, because lists aren't the ideal data type. Um, first of all, Lists are not the numerical vectors or matrices that you might think about. Um, they're just collections of items uh, of any type. Uh, so you can't really do mathematical operations on them. And mathematical operations are exactly what we want to do here. Um, so they're not really the ideal type for, for scientific computing. Um, and it's a better choice, but it's not native to Python. It will be another package. Um, why is it not the ideal case? So here's say a, what we might call a vector of four integers, A. Uh, here it is. Another vector, B, 3, 5, 5, 6. Suppose I wanted to add vector A plus B, or suppose I wanted to multiply A by 2, sorry. Um, 2 times A is not 2, 4, 6, 8, but is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm getting the list twice. And then it's logical too. It's a list. You want twice the list, here's twice the list. Um, but it, if you meant to compute the uh, uh, double of each of the numbers, it's not, it's not doing it. Adding two of these vectors is just appending them. So they're not vectors, they're lists. You want a list, you want to add another list, well, it's a longer list. Um, so that's not what you want if you're doing numerics on a set of data. Even if the data is a numeric, this is usually not what you want uh, uh, when you're adding things together. So uh, the NumPy package, another one of the slides that starts with ne and ends with the and starts with package, NumPy. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of NumPy. It's such a, an ingrained uh, part, but it's a separate package. Um, and it is the package that uh, starts almost all numerical work on Python because it gives you actual arrays. It gives you uh, vectors, matrices, stuff like that, um, multidimensional arrays. 
And it has a number of ways of, in which you can create them, you can work with them. It has uh, compiled parts, which should make it fast. Um, so we start with importing uh, NumPy. Um, let's look at just two functions from NumPy, zeros and ones. They can create an array of zeros. Here's an array of five zeros, an array of five, uh, array of ones. Um, the default type for NumPy arrays is uh, floating point, 64-bit uh, floating point. So that's what the dots here represent. If I want it to be not that, say integers, I just specify the D type, and then it becomes the type. Um, I can have a multidimensional array of zeros, a uh, two by two array of zeros. Um, I can uh, create a range, so let's import the A range function. Uh, an A range five is much like the range function in Python, but it actually creates an array. It's not a, a generator, so it has an array starting from zero, going to four, because the number you specify is the first number you don't get. You don't get five, first number you don't get. Um, there's another one called linspace that is a bit more versatile, where you can say, I want something that ranges from one to five, and uh, with, I think, what is this, five, uh, 50 points. Um, inclusive, so one and five are both in there. If you want to specify how many points you want, uh, so it goes a little bit off, but um, it's, uh, it, you specify that you want six points. It's a great way to quickly make a grid of points, um, and, and it's just part of NumPy. Uh, but what it really makes, uh, what makes these arrays better than the, than the lists is that they don't do this weird stuff of appending when you add things. Um, so we can think of them as vectors, uh, if they're one-dimensional, or matrices if they're two-dimensional. And when you uh, do operations on them, they are element-wise operations. If you're coming from a Fortran background, um, Fortran does the same thing. You add two arrays, um, it does element-wise operations. This works the same uh, kind of way. Um, so if you, add, if you take a vector and you multiply two vectors, you get element by element multiplication. Uh, if you take a vector and you multiply it by a number, each element of the vector is multiplied by that number. Um, if you want to do an inner product, these are vectors after all. If you just did times, it would do element-wise operations. That, doesn't, uh, that might not be what you want. You want an inner product or dot product. There's a special operator there, uh, the add sign, because a star was already taken. Um, so uh, usually people import NumPy as NPy, NP uh, because they're lazy and five characters is way too much to type. Two is much better. Um, create an A range. So that's zero, one, two, three. Another A range, you can give two numbers and you say where it starts and where it uh, ends. Um, and a, uh, a, a constant C, say. So A and B are vectors, C is a constant. Uh, these are their values. Uh, if I multiply A times B, it multiplies 0, 3, 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. There we go. If I multiply by a, a constant, then each of the elements are done. So this behaves the way I would want a, a numerical array to behave. Um, yeah. You can't see the result of the dot product, but it works. Um, now, we can multiply a vector in a vector, and that's element-wise, and that kind of makes sense. They're the same, if they're the same size, at least. Uh, what if we multiply a matrix, so a 2D array with a vector? Uh, we can do that, too. And it's element-wise, but they don't match. What, like, there are not enough elements in the vector to multiply that matrix. It's still element-wise, but it does something kind of funny. Um, it repeats your vector, uh, if it can, uh, so that it becomes a, a repeated uh, a matrix shape. Um, an example makes this a little clearer. So here's an A, a two by two, a two by three array. Um, then I have a vector which has three elements. So if I multiply A times B, I get another matrix back. If you're used to linear algebra, a matrix times a vector gives you a vector, not a matrix. Um, here it does give you a matrix. And so what happens, uh, if I don't want that, if I want the linear algebra for way of doing matrix vector multiplication, I need, again, this at sign. So the at sign is more versatile than just giving you the inner product. It also can you, give you uh, matrix vector operations. And then you get the linear algebra correct answer. So just to be a bit clear, and this, is small, this was supposed to be smaller, um, when you multiply a matrix with a vector that doesn't quite fit, it repeats that vector for each of the rows. I personally hate this feature. It's called broadcasting. I think it's too ambiguous. You have to guess what's happening. I'd rather do this uh, uh, more explicitly, but this is what it does. Um, 
Um, whereas if you had the add sign, then it basically it adds each of these numbers and gives you a, a value, and which I like because I'm very used to linear algebra, but of course if you're not, I guess the first one makes more sense to you. But keep in mind, this is a difference, but you see it very clearly. If you expect a matrix out and you get a vector, something was wrong. If you get a vector out and you expected a matrix, uh, same thing. It gets a little trickier, and that's kind of why I, I, I uh, take a, a moment to discuss this, when you multiply two matrices. So here's two matrices, A and B. Uh, if I multiply them, I get another matrix. That makes sense. It's element-wise, right? 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 4, 3, 3. There we go. Those are the squares. So that does exactly what you would, might imagine. If I take the add, I get also a matrix, but it's a different matrix, because that matrix adds the, uh, the different elements. Right? So this is the linear algebra one. And this can be confusing, um, because if you're expecting one or the other, you don't see it from the shape. It's not as obvious. So it's something to keep in mind. What, what kind of product do you really want? Okay, enough about linear algebra, uh, just, uh, but we have arrays. Uh, these arrays are supposed to be fast, because everybody says NumPy arrays are fast, so if you have slow code, just go to NumPy. Um, does this work? So I'm taking the same code. We had these lists of lists, and we just replace them with NumPy arrays, because they are fast, and see what happens. This is what happens. So our first case had 212 seconds of runtime, which was already 400 times slower than our C++ code, right? Um, the NumPy array is uh, 650 seconds. Um, we're somehow down the wrong track. Am I going to send you to C++? No. Not. But this is the point where we can really try and understand why, why is Python slow? I mean, it's, it's slow. We saw it. The evidence was there. We're going to have to understand why. 